At this time, I invite uh, Reverend Stephen Johnson to our pulpit. He's a very familiar face to us. He's been here summer after summer. And I'm going to ask that you say a little something about yourself, what you've been doing in the past, where you are working right now, and uh, how we can pray for you as you just moved into something new this past year. And uh, we welcome you to our uh, pulpit, and may the Lord bless you, and may we be blessed through you as you bring a message to us. Welcome. Good morning. I come for the free lunch. The first time Bev and I used uh, the cottages down at the end of the road there at Galilean, we, uh, I think we arrived probably on a Sunday afternoon. We immediately, the next day, looked for where we would worship the following Sunday, and we found uh, Emmanuel. And then we were so pleasantly surprised that we arrived on the Sunday they happened to have a lunch. And then we found out they have lunch every Sunday in the summer. But because we kept coming summer after summer, Bev then had to plan, what am I going to bring to lunch? Because we can't keep showing up for a free lunch. And so she would make brownies or something like that. Anyway, it is a, uh, just a privilege for me to be here this morning uh, with you. It's a privilege for me in my new role with One Hope Canada to oversee a number of camps uh, uh, in Ontario. And uh, I am going to bring you God's word this morning, but I'm also going to share a bit of my recent history with you. And so uh, I, I will back up and just say I have uh, four children, and uh, they were impacted highly by going to camp. They were impacted highly by Emmanuel, by the fellowship that we saw here, uh, by the incredible grace that you show and have shown over the years. And so I just encourage parents and grandparents, uh, never give up on your kids. Uh, hang on to them. Do everything Here's the thing. We spend a lot of time in church talking about discipling and saving the world. God has put children under your roof. That's your very first objective, to disciple those. And so God gave us four human beings created in his image. And our number one goal in life before anything else was to disciple them and point them to the cross. Yes, they had to make the decision, but we had to do everything we could to point them to the cross to come to make that decision. And so I just encourage you in that. I do want to share a bit of my recent history with you, one of the most painful, confusing times of my life. And we thought that all ended when we were 17 and 18, right? Uh, some challenges we face are like acute pain. They're sharp and deep and painful, but then they go away. Then there are the ones that are chronic. Can you relate with that? They go on and on and on, and they can drain us of hope and faith, and friends, and isolate us, leaving us feeling alone and confused and in a near hopeless situation. And in that situation, we cling to him because there is nothing left. Everything else has been taken away. But God does that on purpose. He brings us to those points. I would not wish it on my worst enemy, and yet I would not change any of it, what God took us through. It leaves its mark on you forever, and it shapes your future. I am pretty confident that if Bev and I had not gone through what we had been through, I would not be standing here in front of you this morning as the Ontario Field Director of One Hope Canada. I can pretty well say that, because my decision-making in what I needed to do for my security changed after God ripped everything out from underneath me and showed me there is nothing secure in this world. You have no job security. You have no security whatsoever other than Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He takes us where we need to go and to get to where he wants us to be next. Uh, One Hope Canada oversees 45 Christian camps across Canada, and I have the privilege of overseeing seven ministry points in Ontario, four camps, one of which, of course, is Galilean Bible Camp and Conference Centre, along with two Bible clubs in Sault Ste. Marie and a ministry to First Nations youth on Manitoulin Island. And in all of these, our goal is to present the one hope we have in Jesus Christ to those Canadians 
with the least opportunity to hear, especially children and youth. And so I invite you to please check out our website at onehopecanada.ca. Uh, my wife, uh, Bev, wishes she could be here. She can't, but she will be back up for holidays uh, in two or three weeks uh, with some of our kids. Uh, we have four grown children, as I mentioned, who have all been active in missions. And one of the things the Lord used to develop their love for him was in attending Christian camps through their developmental years. First as campers, then leaders in training, then counselors, section heads, and directors. And so I encourage you as parents, send your children to camp. First to attend, and then to serve. And do it as a financial sacrifice. I know what it's like when your kids turn a certain age. It's like time to go get a real job. Not necessarily. Maybe it's time for them still to grow and develop in the Lord. And that's the financial sacrifice of a parent is to send them to go and serve at camp during those years when they could be bringing in some income. And it can be painful and a difficulty. But it's a powerful thing for their development and their years ahead. And so I, I just encourage you in that uh, as a giving of your children to the Lord that he might claim them as his very own. I would also encourage you to prayerfully and financially support the ministry team right here at Galilee Bible Camp. Uh, it has been a privilege for me to sit in the kitchen with Bill just and talk about the Lord when he isn't running around cooking up a storm. Uh, that has been a pleasure with me. It's been a pleasure for me to, to visit with uh, Rod Gordon as he oversees the grounds and to hear him share with me that he, how much he enjoys relying on the Lord to provide his needs because it keeps him faithful. What an awesome thing. I uh, want you to pray for two new additions to Galilean, Florin Buckner and Patty Brown. Where's Laura Elliott? Girl, you up there with that guitar? You go. That was awesome. I've just been thrilled to be able to meet so many of the staff and some of the summer staff a couple weeks ago be able to sit at breakfast with them. And I'm just so thankful to the Lord uh, for his people. And I want to thank you guys for just giving your life and giving your summer to the Lord. And I just, uh, I just want to encourage you, don't, don't quit. Don't give up. Don't become a boring Christian with boring Christianity. God has an incredible adventure, and he drives crazy. And so you need to hang on. Don't let him sit shotgun. Give him the wheel. Let him take control. Let him drive, and he will take you places you never thought you would go. And it will be an incredible venture. Or you can have a boring Christianity that I had for a few years of my life before I, I decided all or nothing. And, and isn't, that, isn't that the fact for all of us? All or nothing? Amen? Amen? Uh, please also pray for, for the, 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 the board and Bill Kay and her staff as they oversee young people and young adults and and especially for children to come to know Jesus Christ this summer. I gave my heart to the Lord at age five. I grew up as a pastor's kid, graduated from Bible college, was in business for 15 years, followed by 10 years as an ordained pastor, five years as a director for Focus on the Family Canada. I have a great wife, four fabulous kids, and then at age 53, I found myself laid off, but with a certainty to soon to be employed in whatever the next ministry would be. I was sure of it. I was confident in that. The Lord had other plans. And a timing I could not foresee. He brought lots of ministry, lots of work, but not employment. Any security I thought I might find in this world was taken away. Four months went by. Six months. Then eight. Then a year. Then a year and a half. This is ridiculous. Picture a grown man standing alone in his backyard, hands lifted toward heaven, tears running down his face, wondering where his God has gone. This is not me. This is not my life. Two and a half years without gainful employment. I wish I knew now what I knew then. I would have enjoyed my two and a half years a whole lot better. Every day I thought we'd lose the house. Never lost the house. Never missed a meal. <laughs> God provided. He provided all the way through. Kind of like the Joseph story. There was lean years coming, so there was a harvest ahead of time. 
And sometimes things we have, like the equity in our house for security in the future, God has a plan for that now to keep you moving. But going through it was difficult. If you had asked me about someone being unemployed for two and a half years, I would have had a quick and ready answer for you, and it would have lacked grace, and it would have lacked love, and it would have been based on no experience whatsoever. And in reality, it would have been based on an elevated opinion of self with total ignorance to the experiential reality that God does reign and God can do to you whatever he wants. We have to ask God to forgive us when we speak so often of the things we do not have a clue about. I went from a lifetime of having a firm foundation from which to minister to living in the first four verses of Psalm 13. Does anyone know those verses? How long, O Lord, how long will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. I live there. Fortunately, Psalm 13 has two more verses of future hope. And it says, But I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. My hope this morning is that God's word might do one of three things. That it might be an encouragement to those of you who are hurting in chronic distress this morning whether it's a relationship, whether it's a, a health issue, whether it's employment, whether it's financial. Also that it might uh, prepare those of you who will go through some deep and troubling waters in the future. And lastly, that it will help all of us to be a help and encouragement to others who need the body of Christ and the true fellowship of believers and friends during their difficult time. Our faith might be strong, but our flesh is weak, and though we might comprehend truth, we do not always apprehend it. We don't own it. We don't experience it. So much of God's word, especially in the Old Testament, more so in De Deuteronomy, is to remember. And so this morning, for our mutual encouragement and for his glory, I want to remind you that God is near, that he promised never to leave us nor forsake us, even if and even when it feels as if he is far away and as if we are all alone. Life can be unpredictable, especially for those who walk with God. As much as God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, God himself is unpredictable. He rarely does things the way I expect. Hardly ever does things in the time frame I want him to. Can you relate to that? He truly is sovereign, ready to lead those who are ready to follow. But I found he isn't always easy to follow. At times I think it's easier for unbelievers who have no expectations. Whatever happens just happens. It's all just by chance. But for those of us who know God, we know nothing is by chance. It's all a part of his plan. So when the plan appears to go wrong, when things are heading south, when things aren't as they should be, when God allows things to happen, hardships and hurt and confusion, misunderstanding, well, what are we to do as believers? God's supposed to be in control. He's supposed to be loving of us. My mother has macular degeneration and is slowly losing her sight. Like me, she's a big reader. We could lose our voice, we could lose our hearing, but please, not our sight. C.S. Lewis said, you can never get a cup of tea large enough or a book long enough to suit me. That would sum up my mother. What is my mother to think about her God as she slowly loses her sight? I have a friend in India. He was with us just recently for a month. Uh, Pastor Vijay Babu. Uh, Vijay is a Dalit. Do you know what Dalits are? The untouchables. Uh, they're untouchables. They're in the caste system. They're underneath the hoof of the cow. Uh, despised. Uh, Vijay runs an orphan home. He has 92 orphans. He had a problem that came up during the difficult time that Bev and I were going through. 
And this time it was not that Natish, one of the children, fell on the road during a downpour in the rainy season and hit his head and needed an MRI, but they couldn't afford it. It wasn't that the kids were getting sick from the rain coming into the building onto the cement floor where the children sleep. And it wasn't that there was no money for books or tuition or uniforms or education, though that happens often. And it wasn't that there's no food for money, no money for food. That's a regular occurrence there. This time it was that two wild pigs had got into the mess hall, ate up all the food, and the children went to bed hungry. Then in borrowing money to build a stronger wall and a stronger door, the construction workers found a small cobra. The next day they found another cobra, and then a larger cobra, and then another, and then they found snake holes throughout the foundation. The whole mess hall had to be taken down, and a new orphan home building was begun, and it's come out of that. It's usable and a great blessing, but it still requires $25,000 to complete, and in India, that might as well be a zillion dollars. Who's going to pay for that? The overwhelming needs in India and Grace Orphan Home spill over into our lives as we're now family with VJ. And I wonder why the Lord didn't allow VJ to meet someone with deeper pockets than mine. We easily become overwhelmed with the ongoing needs of feeding and clothing, caring and educating for children. Who will meet those needs? It's easy to forget the Lord owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And he's more interested in connecting hearts than he is wallets. I am so glad he brought VJ into my life. During those difficult times for Bev and I, we ministered in four to five churches who'd been without a pastor for a long, long time. They were hurting and confused and desperate and thought God had left them behind. They're feeling lost, wondering how God could leave them as sheep without a shepherd. They're confused and hurting, wondering what happened. Did they do something wrong? Where is their God? We are friends we love who have gone through pain and hurt from their own church without resolve. This should never be. We have friends who have gone through health problems, employment problems, financial problems, marital problems, parental problems, and legal problems. I have a friend right now destined to go to jail, a new believer. And the Lord brought all of this during this difficult time for us. Where is the Lord when your world appears to be out of sync? When there are no answers to everything that seems just so wrong. And on top of that, God remains silent. We've all known short periods of time, but I'm talking long periods. Days turn into weeks, weeks, months, months, maybe even years. You trust in God by fact, by, by his word, because experientially you're not feeling anything. Nothing is as it once was, and it almost feels as if you're in exile. So I want to encourage you to hold fast, stand firm, and press on, no matter what your circumstances. He has not abandoned you. There is hope. My parents are British. My mother taught me, when a crisis comes, you have to do first things first. Have you heard the expression, put the kettle on, we'll all have a nice cup of tea. That's my mother's answer to problems. In fact, it's the Englishman's answer to disaster. My parents also taught me to keep calm and carry on. Actually, it was trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. But that's hard to find on a mob. Uh, the, the whole promotion of the keep calm and carry on phenomenon, uh, it was taken from a, a 1939 war poster uh, created in England. It was never really used, but it picked up steam around the same time I was being Downsized. Anybody been downsized? Not a nice word. After 34 years of being employed, 34 years of following the Lord in career and calling and choices, I was out of work and wondering, 
And I thought the keep calm, carry on message was a good one for us. So we went out and bought a teapot and a mug, and we thought we better just keep calm and carry on and see what the Lord's going to do. Or more like what? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Can you say it with me? And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. He is our answer. Not Oprah, not Dr. Phil, not Dr. Oz. Your answer isn't in the self-help section. CrossFit is not going to be your answer. It isn't in education or degrees, and it isn't in the best resume or great networking. I can tell you that for a fact. It isn't in you taking the bull by the horns and fixing your problem. That would be leaning on your own understanding. Not only does the God of the universe want us to come to him, he abhors it when we do not. Woe to the the obstinate children, declares the Lord. He's talking to his own people. In Isaiah 31 to 3. To those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming alliance but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Oprah, actually it's who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge, but Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame, Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. I want to encourage you this morning, if you're going through a hardship, settle down. Trust in the Lord and the Lord alone to keep calm and carry on. If you have your Bibles with you, I hope you do, and I invite you to turn with me, please, to Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. What to do when you're feeling as if you are in exile, displaced and cut off from getting answers, and direction from God. When you're feeling alone and dry, with no answers, no help, perhaps your friends have deserted you, there's no sense of his presence, and so much time has already gone by. Exiled. Jeremiah 29. Without taking too much time to look at the historical background, in 586 B.C., the Babylonians ransacked Israel, took the best of the best, and left the rank and file behind. They took the craftsmen, the artisans, the skilled laborers, and left the others behind. One of the most important things to know is that God did this. In this case, the Israelites had sinned. God was disciplining those he loved for their ultimate good and for the ultimate outcome of his plan for them and for us, and of course that was the coming of the Messiah. But here's the thing to know. God initiated the exile. God used Nebuchadnezzar, Judah's enemy. In fact, God called him my servant. Jeremiah 27, verse 6. He calls their enemy his servant. You and I can take great comfort in the fact that our God is sovereign. Our God reigns and rules and uses whomever he so chooses to accomplish his will. Everything and everyone is an instrument in his hands used as he sees fit. If you can grasp it, God did it to you. He may have used an evil king, an unjust boss, a wicked situation and circumstances, but he used it to bring you into exile. And our temptation will be to get out as quick as possible, to end it as soon as we can. We may take control, we may compromise, we may be tempted to settle for less, in order to bring an end quickly to what God is allowing us to go through. I encourage you, don't do it. Walk with him. Trust him. See what he's going to do through it. And in this long wait, we tend to look around for answers, for an escape route, instead of looking to God who brought us here. Our heart disengages with self and with others. We start to self-isolate. And we cut ourselves off, in a sense, from God. So what's the answer? Look at chapter 28. Verses 1 through 4, here we have the prophet Hananiah. They've been exiled, they've been carried off, and Hananiah comes along and says, hey, it's not so bad, we're all going home in two years. God told me. You ever had someone come up and say, God told me? And you say, well, he didn't tell me. That's what's going on with Hananiah. God told me we're all going back in two years. And look at verse 6. The prophet Jeremiah is all for that idea. He's like, amen, if that's the truth, fabulous. Bring it. Let's all go home, if that's what God says. 
And prophet Hananiah, he's insistent upon it in verses 10 through 11. He, he breaks that yoke that, uh, that I, Jeremiah has been wearing. He breaks it off and says, no, God says, break the yoke, two years. And then, of course, uh, the Lord reveals to Jeremiah in verses 12 through 14 that Hananiah is a false prophet. He's telling lies, things that aren't true. And so uh, Jeremiah calls him on it in verses 15 to 16, tells him he's preaching rebellion, he's going to die for it, and Hananiah the prophet dies in the seventh month of that same year. On a side note, we need to be good Bereans to be sure what you hear from pulpits is what the word says. Teachers will be held to a higher account. Help them to stay sharp. I am so thankful for your pastor, for Rusty, for the preaching I have heard from him, a man of the word who preaches the truth. We tend to think sometimes false teachers are all out there, but that's not what scripture says. It says they're, they're among you, and so we need to be in God's word to know what the truth is in order to know what a counterfeit is. In chapter 29, we find the answers to being in exile, and it comes in the form of a letter to those in exile, and it's a letter from God, and I want to pick up verse, at verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. The very first thing we see is to keep calm and to carry on. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, get married, have babies. Give your daughters away in marriage and know that God is with you. You may be in exile for different reasons. It may be for the purpose of refining you for what it's, what's next, like Peter was, or Moses. Maybe it's to get your attention, to draw you back. Maybe it's simply to rescue you, to prepare you. Regardless, we need to settle down and rest and surrender, humble ourselves, be quiet and repentant, and wait. Look at verse 4. Who should you be listening to if you're not listening to Oprah and Dr. Oz? when you're not getting all caught up in the, the, the joys of CrossFit. There's nothing matter with it. It's just, it's not the answer. Verse 4 says, you listen to God. Listen to what God says. He speaks to us through his word primarily, through prayer, through believers. Why listen to God? Because of who he is. The Lord Almighty. He's the creator of the heaven and the earth. He's your heavenly father who loves you more than your earthly father loves you. Earthly fathers, what would you do for your children? We'd do anything, wouldn't we, for our children? I would die for my children. How much more the Heavenly Father loves us. And he wants the best for us. So we want to listen to him. Notice something else in verse 4. You're not alone. He did not send you into exile. Look at what it says there. I carried you into exile. You may very well be in exile. It's very different than anything else you've been through, but he carried you here for a purpose. I sincerely believe and have experienced that God usually takes us through tough times, a dark time, a valley, before he brings us to a new place, to a higher plane. He has not forsaken you, nor will he ever forsake you. He's with you even now. That's a promise. It's his promise to you and I. So keep calm. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 tells us, build houses, strong ones, with porches, invite the neighbors over. Uh, during our exile, when you're off work for two and a half years, you got lots of time. My, my wife loved it. Uh, new floors, new countertops, uh, lots of things going on in, in, in building the house, a new patio, on a budget, but it didn't, but, but we still did it, and Suddenly, now my next door neighbors are over because everybody has an opinion on how to do something, right? So we grew in our community all around us as we did this. You have no idea what a witness it is to others. We didn't. When you enjoy the Lord during exile, when other people know what your situation is and yet you're enjoying him. Have you ever had so many bad things happen in a row that you laugh and you do give up? 
not saying everything was rosy, still cried out to the Lord like a baby in my backyard, but learned to wait and rest in him and enjoy what we could. Look at the next thing it says, settle down. Take it as a rebuke or take it as an encouragement, but settle down. Stop panicking. Stop worrying. Stop wondering. Did I miss something? Did we miss something that God was trying to show us? The thought of love is not going to hold you accountable because you missed something. We need to settle down. In Isaiah 30, 15, it says, In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. And so settle down. Trust God. Next it says plant gardens, water and wait, watch for growth. Plant perennials, not annuals. Plant vineyards, you may be here for a while. You might produce the best wines. Uh, put a brand new flower garden in. We, during our exile, our daughter chose to get married. We thought, hey, great timing. I'm out of work and we're going to have a wedding. Uh, so, of course, Bev wanted to grow flowers. So we put a new garden in. We did a lot of gardening and we just enjoyed the things of him. Uh, produce new things. It says, eat what they produce. Produce different things. New things. Get the best Babylonian recipes. Learn to live at peace in this place and time. We, we during this time, an Italian couple, new Christians, uh, came to know the Lord, and they were in a desperate strait, and, and, and we just kind of merged together. The Lord eventually formed a home church, but uh, our Italian friends uh, taught us uh, how, to, how to really eat. Have you ever had deep fried zucchini flower tops? Zucchini flower tops, who knew? Deep fried with risotto. Oh, now you're talking heaven. Look at verse 6. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Proposals give your sons and daughters away in marriage. We had a wedding. And God paid for it. Not others. God did it. It was an amazing thing. In a time when money was scarce, the Lord provided this wedding in abundance. Like Elijah being fed daily by ravens sent by God in the middle of a drought. And so God arranged a celebration of our daughter Emma to David, a good Irishman. They're missionaries with Urban Promise down in Toronto, working in Toronto housing community. And so some of the ladies from the community uh, came up and did all the catering and cooking for us. And so we actually had it at a, at a, a camp, um, Camp Minioe. We used their, their grounds, and we had all these people from the inner city come up, people who've never seen anything but cement and concrete. It was such a joy, and, and God did it all. You don't want to miss out on what God can and wants to do and the best part is is when we can learn to trust him as we go through it it does an incredible thing for everybody around you think about it this way annoy your friends by showing sheer joy when panic is in order next procreate have babies and grandbabies i never understood the whole grandparent thing like really grandparents are annoying now I'm one of them, right? Used to be, you know, you take out all, now you pull your phone out. Oh, look. Oh, isn't she sweet? We're one of them. We had, had grandchildren. Went down to Chicago to be with our children as the first one was born. And so it's like, as you're going through these difficulties, continue to celebrate life. Continue to trust in the Lord. The best thing for us now is after we've been through it is to hear from our kids who never said much. My daughter's going through a difficult time right now. And she's saying, the best thing is I watch what God did in your life. We need to hold on to him because there's nothing else anyway. Keep calm. And secondly, verse 7, carry on with ministry in your community. Look at verse 7. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you in exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Continue to allow God to use you even as he's taking you through hardships. 
after having been under an umbrella of ministry, whether it's the fellowship or focus on the family, suddenly I was out on my own. And what an incredible thing God did in our life. He showed us so many new things, uh, new ways of doing ministry. Uh, it grew to include many new things and many new ways of doing things. I was kept busy and engaged in ministry so much that there was times where we saw ministry all around us and you kind of step back and go, uh, Lord, don't forget me, the one out of work. But the ministry was incredible. And to be able to watch God at work all around you what, what was an incredible thing. And so you need to continue to grow and expand even as you wait for the Lord to show you next steps. It's a good time to think outside the box and to keep calm and carry on. During our time of exile, we ministered to a mentally challenged man who lived in our home. We did not plan that one. God did. We learned so much about mental health. It opened our, our hearts up and our minds in those areas. We ministered to churches and individuals with many different hurts and confusions and shortcomings. We ended one group and started another, which grew into what we call Church Without Walls, our home church. God is showing us so many new ways of doing ministry. So be open to what God has for you while you're in exile and keep calm and continue to carry on. He's changing your heart while you're doing that. Third, in times of exile, don't look all around for answers and don't seek answers in man. Look at verses 8 and 9. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. We must be focused on Jesus Christ and be in God's word. You know that old adage, get in his word and what? And his word gets in you. Most of us do not understand false teaching or being deceived. We think false teachers are very obvious. The health, wealth, prosperity teachers. We see them, they're obvious. However, even as false teachers were there among the people in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the same is true today. And just as the same people were deceived then, we can be, de be deceived today. We tend to think that because we're believers, we won't be deceived. That's not what Scripture says. Look up 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 and 4. I invite you to turn there because you need to see this verse. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4, and highlight it. Listen to what Paul says. He says, But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray, listen to what it says, from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The reason we might put up with things easily enough, the next verse says, for if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preach, or if you've received a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. It's not because we're pagan and wicked and evil and away from God that we can be deceived. It's because we're not in God's word. We're not in prayer. We're not in a tight fellowship. We can be under the Christian banner and yet be deceived by Satan, by his cunning, from our sincere and pure devotion to Christ. We have exchanged the call to live a repentant life and a tight life with Christ, filled with his spirit and presence, dying to self and living for him, for a Christianity void of power. What's that verse that says, uh, having a form of godliness but denying its power? So many of these warnings and verses, we kind of put them out there. And I've come to realize the Bible doesn't do a lot of warnings to pagans. It's all to believers. It's to us. Is it Christianity without Christ? Have you been in that situation? I have. I know I'm on the narrow path. Going to church, going to Bible study, reading my Bible, and as I'm walking along the path, suddenly it dawns on me. Where's Jesus? I got caught up in a Christianity, but without the living Christ. We need to get back there. We, we can't live without him. We want to have a life marked by love and joy and peace 
patience, kindness, forgiveness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That can't be faked. We know it can't be faked. Not if we want it inside of us. That only comes from a living faith in the living God. Knowing that Jesus is alive and dwelling within us. We need to think about those things more and more. Scripture tells us those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again. That's our goal. Get our eyes fixed on Jesus and watch him do the miraculous, regardless of the circumstances around us. Fourthly and lastly, while in exile, find answers in God. Look at verse 10 through 14 as we conclude. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Look at verse 10. First God, he has a plan and a schedule. In this case, when 70 years are completed, not two years that Hananiah said, God has a plan and a schedule. In his time, he will do it. We need to first learn that. His timing, not mine. It's not instant. He'll do it. And in the meantime, what do we do? Keep calm, carry on. Or, say it with me, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will in his time direct your path. God has a plan to schedule. Second, God's plan starts now while in exile. Look at verse 7. He alludes to our prosperity while in Babylon, not after. And here in verse 11 to 13, he plans to prosper you right here in Babylon, not back in Jerusalem. I will be found by you, verse 14, in exile, in Babylon, and then I'll bring you back to Jerusalem. He's the Alpha and Omega. He initiates it all. From carrying us into exile to fulfilling his plans to bringing us back. I want to close by looking at what God knows will happen while you're in exile in verses 12 and 13. Look at 12 and 13. This is what God knows is going to happen because of him bringing you into exile. Verse 12. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I used to see these verses as a promise that when you seek God with all your heart, you'll find him. And that, that is a principle. But that's not primarily what it's saying here. Look at it again. It's God telling us what is going to happen because of being in exile. Cut off from everything else. He now has my full attention because there's nothing else. We are going to seek him with all our hearts. We are going to call on him. We are going to come to him and we are going to pray. And now he has his attention and he can bless us and talk to us. It starts with us calling on the Lord, coming to our senses like the prodigal son. We'll call on God. We will come to him. We'll draw close to him. We will move toward God in prayer and faith and the word. And now God can begin to do what he wants to do with us. God planned it, and here he tells us that this is what's going to happen to you. you. You are going to seek me. You're going to find me. During the hardship and exile, he's actually doing an incredible work on your heart, breaking you down so that you can come to know him in a whole new way. If you're finding yourself in exile, thank God for it, even though it's scary and hard, and feels as if he may not be there. Cling to him when there's nothing else. And watch for the days of head. Because I'll tell you, once you come out, the, the, the things he teaches you. Here's the biggest thing I'm going through now. I just want to conclude with this. Is I used to think that I needed to trust him to get me through this stuff. Now I'm learning to have a sense of peace and rest as I go through it. 
because he is in control and he loves me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We give you thanks. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love and compassion for us, even though sometimes it does not feel like it. We pray that you would guide us and direct us, pull us out, put us in, move us around, but we pray that we would be willing to allow you to have your way with us all to your glory. And we thank you, Lord, for the incredible uh, sunrise when we come out of hardship. We praise you and give you great thanks this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen.